Hello and welcome to episode 216 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director here at the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, or former Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this morning, Bill? Doing great, Seth. You know, I'm, I'm amused by some of the comments we're getting um, from viewers, listeners, about things like, you know, my goatee that I had in the very first few episodes and wanting me to grow it back. And my wife has nixed that. But you know, to, to head off any comments about my glasses, yeah, I'm wearing glasses now. You know, those <laughs> stories that my eyes went bad when I was at the academy kept me from being an astronaut. I was nominated for an astronaut mission specialist back in the day, but my vision was too bad. The problem with glasses is that um, they make it hard to look at a periscope. So when I was Commodore, the Navy decided, look, if you're a submariner, we're going to give you this LASIK surgery, which mm -hmm. I got. And it was great for looking at the periscope because looking out through it with glasses is not fun. Um, and that was, what, uh, 17 years ago. And, and over time, my vision started to grade again. So if you see CO, uh, pictures of me when I was CEO of the submarine, I'm wearing glasses. When I'm Commodore, I wasn't. And now I'm wearing them again. So... If people are curious about that, yeah, there they are. Not 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 happy about having to wear them. I've I've uh, I've been very lucky in that I've always been blessed with eagle eyes, but uh, I can't hear worth a damn. So so you got to yeah. give something to get something. I find you know and you know such as it is. No, my so, uh, my hearing has always sucked, so now my vision sucks just as bad. Yeah, well, my wife makes up for it because she's blind and she's got dog hearing. So you know. We're, we make a good team. So, yeah. <laughs> before before we get started with uh, this week's episode, I just I, I do want to make the plea again. Um, please like our videos and subscribe to our channel. I know a lot of you have here in the recent weeks since we've started asking you to do this. So please continue to do so as it helps others find our show. Uh, we want to get the history to the masses, so to speak. And if you want to help us do that, then hit that subscribe button and like the episodes as I don't know how YouTube's algorithm works, but it does work in that manner. So uh, if you want to help us out, that's the best way to do so. And we would greatly appreciate that effort. Uh, so this week, we're going to take a step back, um, as we sometimes do. And we're going to step back to the heady, day, heady days of August of 1942. Uh, the United States is 10 days into the Guadalcanal campaign with elements of the 1st Marine Division entrenched on that island, awaiting the expected Japanese counterstrike that is in reality only days away at Alligator Creek. Uh, the Japanese have pounded the Allies offshore at Savo. Their aircraft range free over the island now coded as cactus, and they own the seas at night and maneuver with near impunity during daylight hours. Assuming that an even larger counter thrust is soon to be on the way, American forces hatch a plan that will, in theory, divert Japanese attention away from the action of Guadalcanal and force the enemy to respond to an assumed threat on their Central Pacific holdings in the Gilbert Islands. Specifically, we are going to talk about a very small island, atoll, really, in the Central Pacific that was the focus of this daring, if not somewhat foolhardy, raid. Uh, the raid against this island had good intentions, some of which were personal proving grounds for new tactics and units and also leaders of men. The raid was just one of a very few, quote, commando style raids that the U.S. launched in the Pacific War. And the unit assigned to this raid was perfectly suited for this style of combat. Uh, this unit was led by a revolutionary leader, one whose infantry tactics and leadership style were more reminiscent of the Chinese than that of the United States Marine Corps. Uh, the Marine Colonel was a polarizing figure then and is now, who led a highly trained specialized unit designed for infiltration and behind the lines operations. We are, of course, talking about Evans Carlson and his 2nd Raider Battalion and the infamous raid on Macon Island. Bill, this is a, um, a very interesting topic and one that we purposely skirted over when we were doing Guadalcanal, mainly because we wanted to keep it you know, laser focused on the canal and not drift off in other areas. Although this raid does have Guadalcanal implications. Um, it, it was, this, like we said in the intro, it was designed to be a part of the Guadalcanal campaign and in, in that it was divert, designed to divert forces, but it wasn't hatched 
when Watchtower was hatched, was it? It was it was a completely different operation, wasn't it? It was. And so there are, you know, all kinds of military strategies called faint operations, F-E-I-N-T, not F-A-I-N-T, which is an operation intended to distract the adversary and make them believe you're pursuing a course of action that's different than what you're actually doing. Um, and so there were a couple of reasons why uh, this became this idea became appealing. Um, there was concern that the Japanese would pour 100% of their resources into our offensive at Guadalcanal. And, you know, I think we're going to probably say this several times during this episode, we had no resources to spare. There was no strategic reserve. There was nothing we can do to back up the Marines and soon army forces that were going into the canal. So if we could somehow distract the Japanese from worrying about, but to have something more to worry about than right. Guadalcanal, like they think that something else is gonna happen and they hold their reserve forces in case you know we attack somewhere else then that assists the troops on Guadalcanal um, in their campaign. The question is, where do we go and what do we go with? So that's the strategy aspect of it. There's a capability aspect of it that marries up with the strategy aspect. The capability is that there were people in the United States who were arguing that the United States needed a different kind of raiding force than we had, which were fairly purely conventional. Even the, even the Marine amphibious forces were fairly conventional amphibious forces. And so there were different factions within the United States. Initially, interestingly, not even within the Marine Corps that were arguing that we needed to develop a capability to conduct raids. So that's the capability side with the strategic side of wanting to do a kind of a fake end run that would distract the Japanese. And those two things came together in this, you know, kind of serendipitous way for FDR, Franklin Roosevelt to say, okay, I want you to move uh, a, a force and do it in the Pacific somewhere to distract mm -hmm. the Japanese. But, but Seth, where did this actually, the capability side of this raiding force, where did that idea originate? So it, it it originated by a guy who you wouldn't necessarily think it would have. It didn't come from some, you know, Marine lieutenant sitting at a bar. It certainly didn't come from the commandant. It came from a gentleman named Wild Bill Donovan. Uh, Wild Bill Donovan, who was at that time uh, in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, of course, is the forerunner to the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, Donovan wanted an operation to test new units uh, new tactics and that were specifically designed for these hit and run uh, raids, commando raids. Um, the idea was pushed by Donovan to FDR, who then turned around. FDR loved the idea. You know, Donovan says, "Hey, we need to do this." Da, 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 da. It, it goes to FDR. FDR loves it, and he immediately turns around and pushes it to Admiral King. And Admiral King, to his credit, here was. <laughs> less than thrilled about the idea we should say he didn't our, he didn't crush it but he didn't love it either do you remember our episode that we did on king that was titled uh -huh. admiral king was right about almost everything this was mm -hmm. another thing he was right about when he said you know what it really was i'm not kind of convinced that this is a good idea but but that uh, but king was quashed because fdr was being hit both by donovan and by this maverick that we're going to talk about here yeah. uh, that you've already talked about in your opening and the, how did how did this maverick come to know uh, the president of the united states so so of course the maverick that we're referring to is evans carlson and and we're going to get deep into carlson here in just a couple of minutes we'll get into his, his a brief bio of him but he knew fdr from before the war personally knew him he was executive officer of the Presidential Guard at Warm Springs, uh, which, of course, was the president's I – mean, Roosevelt had polio. He spent a lot of time in Warm Springs, Georgia. So he was Where the executive officer of that unit. 
Correct. Yeah, exactly. Where he ended up dying in 1945, but we're going back right. to 1942 again. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so he, so hey, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of getting our head of ourselves, but Evans Carlson had a lot of stroke with Franklin mm-hmm. Roosevelt. He, he did because he knew him personally. He knew him before the war. Um, and we're, and we're going to get to the fact that also the president's eldest son, James, Jimmy Roosevelt was in Carlson's unit, but we'll get to that too in a minute mm-hmm. here. Right. Go ahead. No, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Oh. so the president knew Carlson from Carlson being, you know, security detail at Warm yeah. Springs. And the president's son, who was also Marine, yeah. was in Carlson's unit. So you got yeah. Carlson hitting up on the president directly, talk mm-hmm. about bypassing the chain of command, saying, hey, you really ought to do this. It's based on stuff I've learned in China. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Yeah. The president's son telling his dad, and I think he even wrote a letter to the Commandant of the Marine Corps saying, he did. hey, we really ought to do this. Donovan telling the president, we really ought to do this, which ends up in the president telling King, we really ought to do this. <laughs> and so the question is, do what with what? And, that, and that's where it started getting into the real chain of command. And people started thinking about, OK, structurally, how do we make this happen? And is it really a good idea? And that's where Nimitz got involved. Is that right? That That so, is exactly where Nimitz got involved. And this is where King's reluctance was. is Because you got to remember, this is August of 1942. We did perform Operation Watchtower, which became, oper- you know, we called it Operation Shoestring for a reason. We didn't have a whole lot of forces to commit to anything. And King was like, eh, we've kind of already sent you know, the kitchen sink, or at least what we can send to Guadalcanal, I really don't want to risk unnecessarily men and materiel when we have neither of which to spare. And and there, this is kind of a case, and, and you can look it up. There's not a whole lot of writing on the Macon Raid, or at least a lead up to it. Um, this is kind of a case of jumping the chain of command in the term in, in Evans Carlson and Jimmy Roosevelt. You know, yeah, that's the president's son, blah, blah, blah. But it kind of circumvent Admiral King that the Pressure gets on King from FDR directly saying, make this happen. It goes to Nimitz and Nimitz thinks it's a great idea. And this is, you know, we talk glowingly about Admiral Chester Nimitz all the time. But in my opinion, this is one of the one of his mistakes. He doesn't make many, but this is one of them because he agrees that this is a good idea. He agrees that, yeah, we should do this. And he's kind of going against his boss, which is never a good idea. And and. He's committing or wants to commit forces when we don't have a lot of forces to commit. And I think this is an instance of, frankly, one of the few times that Nimitz doesn't have, you know, a whole lot of clarity in in, in, in the situation. But I also think that he was getting a lot of political pressure from the outside that, you know, he he's kind of, you know, doing one of these things, you know, ping pong and everything, trying to keep things away. But inevitably, yeah, it- you're going to get hit with a ball. In his defense, he took a big risk with Midway, and that seemed to have proven paid off. And you know, this is we're approaching, you know, summer of 1942, and so I think may, maybe he thought, you know, my luck seems to be going good, my instincts seem to be okay. Maybe this is another thing that will pay off. And one other point to to be made is what we, we you already know the title of this episode is the Macon Island Raid, and so clearly we're going to be talking about Macon Island. At the time, we did not know where the center of gravity for the Japanese in the Gilbert Islands was. We thought it might be Macon Island. So we thought that maybe they're going to really be, the Japanese would be really be sensitive to any affront, any attack that threatened their center of gravity in the Gilberts. It turns out that center of gravity was Tarawa, not Macon Island. But at this point in the war, that wasn't clear to us. So again, he's thinking, you know, if we threaten their center of gravity, even if it's a faint, not a serious threat, it may draw forces away from what we're trying to do in Guadalcanal, which he realized he was smart enough to know we need to succeed there. Right. And I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that it was a bad idea overall to try and draw attention away. It's just at this juncture, August of 1942, it's like, man, we have got. 10 cents to work with and and we need a budget of you know ten thousand dollars so it's like mm, don't want to risk things that we don't necessarily need to and on top of that nimitz thought it was such a good idea he wanted to conduct 
multiple raids on Japanese outposts with landing parties and things like this. And if you recall, February, March 1942, there's the hit and run carrier raids. And that's a little bit different because the carriers can get in and get the hell out of there pretty quick. Admiral Balsey, that's how he made his, his living in 1942 or early part of 42. But putting guys on the shore it's it's a different operation you, you know it's hard to get in and get out when you know we'll we'll get to the logistics of all this but it's just it's the one aspect of the war so far and when you look at admiral nimitz in my opinion it's like mm, might not have been the best decision but i understand the pressure that he was under from the president for crying out loud and and eventually king obviously does relent and like all right fine let's do this and if we're going to do it how are we going to do it so to that end how are they going to do it? How are we going to commit this force? And what force are we going to commit? Um, initially, Bill, to your point earlier, you were talking about different hitting different islands. Wake Island was actually the first intended target. Uh, and then and then Admiral Nimitz remembered, yeah. hey, when I took command, they captured Wake and they tried twice to capture Wake. So maybe this isn't the best place to hit. So the target was changed. You know, there were thousands of troops on both sides of that battle, and and we didn't have thousands of troops to try to take Wake yeah. Island back. In. No, not at all. Not even close. Uh, the raiding force that they were looking, that Nimitz and, and his people were looking at, consisted of 200 specially trained Marines that would arrive theoretically via specialized submarines and assault and retreat via rubber boats, go in and out via the rubber boats. And we'll get to the rubber boats in a minute. I know you have personal experience with that, professional experience. Yeah. So we've talked about raiders, marine raiders before, um, specifically, and we've talked about second raiders and on the long patrol, as it was called on Guadalcanal. And of course, we've talked about Edson's raiders ad nauseum and the 4th Marine Raider Battalion too, but we haven't really dove real deep into the second raider battalion or how the raiders were formed. And we're going to do that here briefly. The term raiders and a Marine Special Operations Force did not come to reality until 1942. The idea of a Marine Special Operations Force was initially proposed in 1941 by Colonel Evans Carlson. Uh, Carlson was a personal friend, as we said, of Franklin Roosevelt. He'd known him for quite some time, since the 30s, and uh, they were pretty close, um, as, as close as a, as a colonel. Actually, actually, at this time, Carlson was a major and a president can be. Um, he... As I was saying earlier, Carlson had a he had a fair amount of stroke with, with the president, probably more so than any other major soon to be light colonel would ever have in the war. Um, as a result of Carlson's experiences in China, and we're going to get to Carlson in just a minute, uh, he fully believed that guerrilla warfare such as that waged by, waged by nationalist and communist Chinese forces against the Japanese on mainland China were the way to go when it came to combating the Japanese in the Pacific. Maybe, Maybe, but not really so much, right, Bill? I mean, this it, it's some of some of his ideas come from different places, shall we say? Yeah. And you yeah. know, I ahead. think you know one of the things that um, you know Carlson. There's this convergence that happens at interesting moments of history, where you've got Donovan. You know, predecessor of the CIA OSS. Most, most people think of Donovan as, in terms of the European theater, not the Pacific theater. But you know, wanting to do something like this, Donovan was an active duty army officer at the time. Um, you know, so he thought tactically as well as strategically. Then you have, you know, FDR's friend um, Carlson, but you also have General Holland, Holland Smith, who was tasked with converting the corps from a paper amphibious force of the 20s and 30s to a real amphibious force. Smith was forced to look at viable alternatives in a world where the Marines did not have suitable landing craft yet, or the number with which to land a sizable force on enemy beaches. Remember, the landings in Guadalcanal were essentially administrative landings, where they were crawling over the sides of landing boats, not you know, my, the kind of Higgins boats that you think of when you think of World War II amphibious right. landings, right? Because right. we didn't have them yet. So in fleet, in the fleet landing exercise six or flex six, Smith landed an entire company from the 5th Marines, 5th Marine Regiment via rubber boats pre-dawn. The force moved inland, seized key terrain features 
that dominated the opposed beachhead and thus ensured a successful landing by the larger force that occurred later that morning. So the theory was sound, you insert a small recon kind of scouting force, and then the larger force lands after you know the recon force because you now at this point you have a better understanding of the disposition of the enemy by the time the larger force lands. Things that we do with U UAVs, drones, and things like that today, or other recon aircraft or satellites. Um, we're done with this excursion landing force with rubber rating craft or what we call today combat rubber rating craft. So he proved that the theory worked in, and again, this convergence with Carlson pushing his ideas and, and Donovan pushing his ideas really pushed the Pacific fleet to put this commando type unit together, right? Mm -hmm. And so a few days later, what was called the second separate battalion of the Marine Corps was born and orders were given to Merritt Edson to send mm -hmm. men for the specific task. And what happened then, Seth? So Merritt Edson was actually, he was actually offered command of this unit initially. And he was like, mm -hmm. I've, I've got other things this to do. He was in Edson's bridge, right? Correct. Yeah. He was forming his own Raider Battalion, 1st Raider Battalion. Mm -hmm. Um the title was the, the command was given to Major soon to be Colonel Evans Carlson. And let, let's take one step back. So, where does Jimmy Roosevelt factor into this kind of sort of confusing story? Jimmy Roosevelt was the president's oldest son. He was in the Marine Corps. He had known Carlson when Roosevelt was a, a young man. Well, not that he was an old man, but when he was a younger man, from Carlson being around Warm Springs. Many sources say that the reason that James Roosevelt enlisted in the Marine Corps in the first place was because of Evans Carlson. Uh, you know, Carlson had a had a sizable amount of sway over Jimmy Roosevelt uh, as he was coming up. And uh, that's one reason more than likely that Roosevelt did enlist in the Marine Corps was because of Carlson. Um, Carlson also knew that obviously Jimmy Roosevelt was in the Marine Corps. He decided that he was going to put a little pressure on Jimmy to get his old man to push this pet project forward, which of course he does. Um, after Carlson takes command of what is then the second separate battalion, um, James Roosevelt is soon assigned, not coincidentally, as the executive officer of this very unit, the second separate battalion, which of course becomes second Raider battalion. Um, the, the Raiders are now born uh, there. And it's, it's interesting to note, and, and we'll, we, we don't have to get too deeply into this. There are two at this time. There's two Raider battalions, first and second, uh, first Raider battalions under Edson. I mean, uh, Merritt Edson, second Raiders are under Carlson. And when you think of these two Marine special operations forces, and that's what they were, you'd think they would be built alike and operate alike. That could not be farther from the truth. They were literally complete mirror opposites. I mean, they were total opposites of one another. They were formed under the image of their commanding officer. And then Merritt Edson wanted a hard, striking, tough, physically infantry unit that just wipes things out. And that's a rating unit, but to a lesser extent, more of a traditional infantry unit. And that's what you see on Guadalcanal. That's just, you see at Tassimboco and Edson's Ridge and different places mm -hmm. like that. Evans Carlson wanted a different type of unit. And we'll get into that here in just a second. We've mentioned his name about 30 times, but who was Evans Carlson? Bill, where did he come from? How did he get to the position that leads him into becoming commanding officer, second Raider Battalion? Yeah, yeah. That's, so again, uh, you know, Merritt Edson is kind of forming his Raider Battalion into shock troops. And Evans yes. Carlson is forming his Raider Battalion into more like irregular warfare is what we would call it today something like what the green berets do and the and he's got a really interesting history that causes his mind to form this way and causes him to think about irregular warfare in the way he does he ran away from home at age 14 lying about his age enlisting in the army he saw some light action in the mexican punitive wars expedition or whatever it's going to call it. and he was discharged but re-enlisted when the united states entered world war one Soon after, he was given a commission, and he was wounded in France. 
But after the war, he was a captain. He was discharged in 1919. He tried civilian life, finding it unfulfilling. He enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1922. So he was only out of the military for about three years. Once again, he was commissioned. Given He was a second lieutenant and spent the first several years of life, life in the Marines stateside training. In 27, he was sent to Shanghai with the 4th Marines. And he was... He was infantry, but you know, in those days, on board Navy ships, you would assign a line officer to be the intel officer. Same thing with the Marine Corps. He was an infantry officer, but he was assigned to be regimental intel officer. And as 4th Marine's regimental intel officer, he studied and became closely acquainted with both the Nationalist Chinese Army as well as the Communist forces under Mao Zedong. Now, it's interesting, a lot of people forget that the communist communism was rising in China in the 1920s, right? It followed the Bolshevik Revolution in, in what became the Soviet Union was Russia and then the Soviet Union. And they liked what they were seeing in the Soviet Union. And so Mao created this communist party in China in the 1920s, trying to do the same thing in China that had been done in the Soviet Union, Russia, Soviet Union. But Carlson's interest in China dominated the remainder of his life. And an infatuation, I don't think that's too strong a word, Seth, an infatuation with the communists in China. So that's kind of bizarre. And in fact, uh, there was a, before we started fearing, remember we were allies with the Soviet Union, in World War II. So we did not have this Cold War fear of the Soviets until after World War II. Similarly, we did not have a Cold War-like fear of the communist China. We thought they were curious and interesting, but they weren't, we didn't think of them as the enemy, particularly as we saw Japan rising. We were more afraid of the fascists in this period of, of American history than we were the communists. And in fact, it was an open secret that Carlson was infatuated with communist China. And as this expression developed among Marines who knew Carlson, yeah, he may be red, but he's not yellow. That's kind of bizarre, uh, a bizarre expression. And that was not a queer killing, you know, dictum as it right. pertained to Carlson in the 1920s. But then he was called back to see some other Marine Corps action in the 30s. Right, Seth? He was. Yeah, he goes uh, he goes to Nicaragua, Nicaragua in the 1930s. Uh, he leads a small unit in a successful guerrilla style assault against a march, much larger unit at night. Um, so he he had a in his years in China, the first tour and by he goes to China multiple times. The first tour that you just talked about, Bill, he was observing these nationalist and communist forces you know, hunt and peck, and, and he's observing these guerrilla-style tactics. And when he goes to Nicaragua, Nicaragua in 1930, he decides to employ those tactics that he mm -hmm. witnessed on his own, and he's successful. He he does a You're good right. job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. First group was, uh, that Americans were exposed to that fought this way were the American Indians, Native Americans, right? right? Irregular right. warfare. Right. Then Carlson get, becomes infatuated with the way Chinese are doing. And in fact, he had two tours in China before he became XO of FDR's presidential guard in Warm Springs, right? Mm -hmm. So he comes back from his second tour of China, observing similar irregular warfare style techniques. And, and that's when he becomes friendly with FDR. We've already talked about that. Right. Yeah. And then he goes back to China again in 1937. Um he actually goes to China in 1937 with his then friend, who later they were not so close, but at this time they were they were pals, Red Mike Edson. Uh, they're going to China to watch as the Japanese capture the city of, uh, I believe it was, yeah, Beijing. Believe it was, yeah, Beijing, yeah. So Peking at the, he, end of the day. Peking, yes, thank you. Yeah, he he's there watching all this stuff go down. Um, he's an assigned. He's assigned as an observer. Uh, he asked for and was granted permission to accompany communist Chinese forces that were called the Eighth Route Army. Uh, Carlson spent over a year with these dudes, watching how they he, fought. He, yeah, 
He became fluent yeah. in Mandarin. So yes. he was speaking to Mao Zedong in his native tongue. <laughs> yeah. Pretty remarkable when you think about it. He really is. He, he's a pretty remarkable guy. And he became obsessed with their tactics. The Chinese, you know, and, and I believe Dave Holland talked about this when we talked about the long patrol. You know, he told his raiders, you know, the Japanese can fight, you know, with a sack of raisins and rice. And that's how we're going to do it. And, you know, Mar Mar Americans aren't built that way. And he absorbed all this all these tactics and these this way of living from specifically this time it's his last time in china with the communist forces and he brings a lot of that back home to the united states and kind of gets himself into hot water when he gets back home and this is not the only time he'll get himself in hot water he gets back home to the united states in like i think 39 38, th late 38, early 39, and he starts giving person. He's an officer in the United States Marine Corps. He starts giving newspaper, you know, uh, interviews, yeah. but cr criticizing the United States for its lack of support of China. Now he's an active duty Marine officer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, FDR's president, and he's criticizing his friend, the president, and the United States for not doing more vis-a-vis -vis China. For not helping yeah. China fight Japan. Sound like Ukraine and Russia? Anyway, we, we digress. Yeah. So he but, actually, what, he resigns his commission? He does. Yeah. He he feels so strongly. Well, first of all, let me get back to this. Uh, he, he starts giving mm -hmm. these interviews and the Navy is like, hey, shut up. You know, you're, you're A, you're bashing us, you're bashing the core, and you're kind of, you know, taking a dump on the president, too, at the same time, and our foreign policy. Cut it out. He feels so strongly, he resigns his commission in the Marine Corps and continues to prophesy about, you know, we should be supporting China more. We should be doing this. We should be doing that. All the while, mind you, the United States is a neutral country. So he's not exactly winning friends and influencing people, shall we say. He's influencing the wrong people at this time in his life and career. But he can't stay out. In April 1941, at some point, I, I think he gets the note, like he gets the memo to shut up because it's not getting him what he wants. He's not on a career path that's going to get him any kind of service that he wants to perform. Uh, he does shut up, but he's made a lot of enemies in that time. And in April 1941, he does rejoin the Marine Corps. They take him back with open arms because they know that the guy is smart. He's skilled. He's got good ideas. Just maybe not be implemented in the way that he wants to implement them, regardless of this. He comes back to the Corps in April of 1941. Um, but he he is an advocate of these, you know, travel light, hit and run, you know, little to no rations, you know, little ammunition. You know, these tactics that the Chinese communists, specifically the Chai Coms, employed in China, he brings that back to the 2nd Raider Battalion. And he is the founding father of the Second Raider Battalion. He's the guy that that brings them up and makes them into what they are. There's, so, there's an expression: infantry tactics are a combination of fire and maneuver. Edson was a fire guy; he was a maneuver guy. I mean, he, I hate to boil it down to those simple terms, but but traveling light, little, very little ammunition, just as much as you think you're going to need, very little rations, so you can maneuver better. That's kind of his concept and the irregular warfare concept that emerged from his ideas that he picked up in the, with the Chinese. Yep. So in building the second Raider battalion, as we, we talked about this briefly, you know, the, the, each battalion became a reflection, a reflection of its commanding officer. However, Carlson enlisted Rose, Jimmy Roosevelt's help, you know, very intimately as they were building second Raiders. Um, it was significantly different than first Raiders. Um, the thing with Carlson was, is that he was an extremely charismatic guy. He was one of those guys that you, apparently you would just, you'd meet him and you just, you wanted to be with his unit. You wanted to do whatever he was going to do. He had no problem attracting volunteers for the second Raider battalion. Now he would weed out a lot of the people that did volunteer and what he wound up coming up with was this really, really tough, hardcore, specialized, trained unit. Um, mm -hmm. 
another thing when the Raiders were forming both battalions, mind you, uh, they kind of had, you know, their pick of the litter when it came to materiel and men. Uh, they, you know, carte blanche, they could do whatever they wanted to do, which really irritated a lot of the other battalion and regimental commanders within the regular Marine Corps. Uh, that didn't really sit too well with a lot of people because they were already fighting for supplies and the Raiders literally had to pick a litter. They could take whatever they wanted. Um, to that end, um, they also inculcated the unit with an unconventional military philosophy. This is what we were talking about earlier, which was a mixture of Chinese culture, communist egalitarianism, and New England town hall democracy. Now, Red Mike Edson was the commanding officer of 1st Battalion. It's This is what we're going to do. He tells his subordinates, this is what we're going to do. Make it happen. <laughs> There's no argument here. Carlson was not like that. He was completely different, wasn't he, Bill? No, yeah. So the, the, the way you can summarize this is that you're picking up on the communist philosophy. Here's everybody is familiar with the expression gung ho. And in American parlance, gung ho means I'm really charged up to do this thing. But it is an actual Chinese expression that Carlson first adopted from the Chinese in China. It's a communist expression. That means work together, not I'm really energized to do this as we've taken it to me. Carlson brought it back to China from China and said, gung ho, we're going to work together. OK, not you know, we're, <laughs> we're zealots in, in whatever it is we're trying to pursue. We're going to be gung ho. It's funny how that definition of that expression has evolved out of a communist expression. And people, I guarantee you, the average Marine doesn't know that. But Carlson brought it back. He used the expression, gung-ho, we're going to work together. Officers would have no greater privilege than the men, which is frankly appropriate, and would lead by consensus, communist style, rather than rank. There would also be an ethical indoctrination, is what he called it. Sound communist? Yes, it does. Which Carlson described as giving conviction through persuasion. In other words, Unlike, let's say, 1st Raider Battalion, 2nd Raider Battalion Marines would, would be have conviction because they would understand why we're doing it, right? And 1st Raider Battalion, I mean, Corps in general, I would say, it, the, the, the private, the Lance Corporal, you don't need to know why. I told you to do it, and you're going to do it, okay? Right. Carlson brought this, okay, guys. You under, I want you all to understand why we're doing this, because we're going to do it together. Gung ho. And this process supposedly ensured that each man knew what he was fighting for and why. And Carlson believed that this would enable him to get more out of his Marines than the normal Marine Corps method. Mm -hmm. And he to to that end as well, Bill, he he formulated a training regimen that that focused heavily, heavily on. And all, all Marines are weapons experts to an, to an extent, and the Raiders in World War II were even more so, because they figured that more often than not they would have to potentially handle enemy weaponry, and they knew how to, they needed to know how to use those. And we're going to see an example of that in a minute. Um, hand to hand fighting, demolitions, physical conditioning, big time, uh, to include emphasis on long hikes. This comes to play on Guadalcanal for the second Raider specifically. As the men grew tougher and acquired field skills, the focus shifted to more night work. Carlson also implemented an important change to the Raider organization from Washington. Instead of a, utilita a unitary eight-man squad, he created a 10-man unit composed of a squad leader, three fire teams of three men each. Each fire team boasted a Thompson, a Browning automatic rifle, BAR, and one of the new M1 Garands. You know, everybody thinks that, and, and this is true, 1st Marine Division didn't have the Garands on Guadalcanal. They stole what they had from the Army, completely true. 1st Raider Battalion goes to Guadalcanal with M1903 Springfield rifles. 2nd Raider Battalion had M1 Garands in the United States, and they went overseas to Macon with M1 Garand rifles. As I said, they had the pick of the litter. They had carte blanche when it came to materiel, and they got all the new stuff. They got all the hot the hot stuff quick. Um so the way Carlson designs his his squads, his his fire teams are they're 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 killers, is, is what they are. An intense amount of automatic weaponry, the the new hot battle rifle, which of course is probably the, the greatest rifle ever 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 created. 
and and they're they're designed for these hit and run gonna knock you out and get the hell out of there and kill everything in sight before you even know what happens tactics very reminiscent of the things that he saw in china obviously without all the automatic weapons because they didn't have the kind of weaponry that we did um his system of organization and training was designed to create a force suited for infiltration and the attainment of objectives objectives by unorthodox and unexpected methods he and roosevelt were very clearly developing the guerrilla unit that he had always since his first days in china envisioned um the training for the raiders continued on the east coast and then they went to the west coast uh, before departing for pearl harbor uh, where Carlson and his men arrived on May 17th, 1942. And one thing that they trained heavily in, Bill, um, the Raiders, especially once they got to the West Coast, because I knew a couple, several Carlson traders, um, they trained in rubber boat training. All Raiders did, but second Raiders specifically, they hit this constantly, where they would do it all day, every day for like weeks at a time. You have some experience in this, do you not? Yeah, I do. Um you know, when you're trying to send in an infiltration team or a reconnaissance team or something like that, and, and you don't have the large, you know, amphibious shipping necessary to do that, there are two main ways you got it. In fact, um, there, there's parachute in. And in fact, in World War II, we had paramarines. We, remember, we talked about them in the Guadalcanal episodes. And the other way to get them in was by submarine. Those are the two kind of secret ways of getting them in. The Japanese didn't have radar that could detect the incoming airplanes in most of the places that we wanted to get into. So that wasn't the real reason. The reason reason was surprise. And the interesting thing is the airplane method of insertion these days has brings with it greater risk than it did in World War II because the everybody does have radar. And you can kind of see those airplanes coming in. So the parachute method is good for places like Afghanistan that are out in the middle of nowhere. Not so good for places that are really built up, let's say first or second world countries. However, submarines still have the element of surprise. So the, the tactic of insertion by submarine in combat rubber, rubber raiding craft still exists today. And, and uh, as, as it so happens, um, there's some photographs here, as it so happens, I've done this. Now, in, when I was captain of USS Indianapolis submarine, SSN 697, we were training for what's called a non-combatant evacuation operation, or NEO for short. And so you, the idea of a NEO is you're trying to get people that are captured out of a country that you don't have access to. And there are several ways of getting troops in to do that. And one way is by submarine. And the Marine Corps has this, what was called in those days, the 10th Force Recon Company out of Okinawa, out of the third um, Marine Division, in essence, out of Okinawa. Um, and the 10th Force Recon Company was the one unit that was specializing, among other things, in insertion by submarine. So I got a couple of photographs here. Let's see if this works. I'm going to share with you. These were my Marines. Um, and there I am, right? Somebody said, hey, get better mouse. I got a better mouse. There I am on my submarine. And these are a platoon of Marines from the 10th Force Recon Company that were preparing for a non-combatant evacuation operation. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this has nothing to do with World War II, clearly, but it does have something to do with what Carlson's about to attempt here, because I have personal experience in how dangerous this is. We rehearsed the insertion, or the insertion pier side during day as the first set, first phase of this NEO operation. And you can see here just getting the rubber boats out of the submarine onto the deck and inflated was a big deal. Then we rehearsed, I don't have too many photographs of the at sea portion, but then we rehearsed doing the same thing on the surface during the day at sea and this is pure side still. And, and finally, we did the rehearsal at sea. Now, the reason this is important is submarines have what's very low, of what's called freeboard. Freeboard is a clearance from the surface of the ocean to the top of the submarine. And what that means is as you're surfaced in open ocean, trying to float, inflate these boats, 
what we what we learned the hard way, unfortunately. And by the way, I did study the making operation before I did this. And as Seth says, there wasn't many lessons learned from the operation published. This is 1997 as we're doing this. What I learned was if you don't really secure those boats down tight against the hull, if a wave comes over the hull, as it's going to do when you're in open ocean, it will lift the boat, shift it, and in my case, pin a marine underneath breaking his femur that we then had a medevac. Okay, so this is a big deal. And this took a lot of rehearsal in daytime in order to make this work before we were before I was comfortable enough to be willing to risk an actual insertion at night. Okay, so that's kind of my bona fides here as it pertains to understanding what Carlson was trying to learn how to do in his submarines in preparation for the Macon raid. I hope that helps. By the way, this photo here is what's called a snag and tow. When you... <clears throat> When you want to pull the Marines or the, and the rubber raiding craft far enough away from land without surfacing the submarine, thereby exposing yourself, you could run. You, this, the, the two boats pull a rope between each other, and you drive the submarine between the two boats and snag that rope with your periscope, and then tow them out to sea. Then surface and recover them. It takes really good ship driving. Yeah, to conduct a snag and tow, as you can imagine, submerged to periscope depth. And I, without being a modest, I have to say I was a really good ship driver. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. It's like riding a big whale right there. <laughs> uh, exactly. Um, so to, to, to Bill's point, um, these guys trained for this. However, they did not train deploying from a submarine. They did not train for deploying from a submarine. They trained going out to sea and coming back in through the surf on the river boats, but never being deployed by a submarine. And we're going to get to that and what happens here in a minute. Um, so on to the, on to the actual operation intrigued by the prospect of special operations in the Pacific at this time of the war we, as we said, Nimitz was eager to use the Raiders, specifically the second Raiders. And you will recall that at this time, the first Raider battalion is had landed at Tulagi on August 7th and the second Raiders were still in Pearl Harbor cooling their heels. They had actually gone to Midway during on uh, just before the fight, um, the battle of Midway, two companies of Raiders, but that's another story for another day. Um, in early August, Macon was chosen as the target for mainly two reasons. One, it was far enough away from Guadalcanal that it was thought that major reinforcements and other military allocations would be drawn away from the Solomons area. This is, goes back to what we'd initially said. They wanted to divert attention away from Guadalcanal. And two, it was also far enough away from Rabaul, which was the main base. It was the Pearl Harbor of the Pacific for the Japanese. Uh, so as to not allow Japanese air or sea power the ability to reinforce the area after the attack was launched. So they chose this place because it was far enough away from Guadalcanal to theoretically divert some of that attention. And it was far enough away from Rabaul that where, you know, these boats that are going to be bringing these guys in hopefully won't be sunk. Um, the plan called for two companies of the 2nd Raider Battalion to make a pre-dawn landing on, I'm going to butcher this name, so... All you linguists out there, give me hell. Butari Tari. Thank you. Butari Tari. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> and destroy the garrison, which was estimated at 45 men. So it's not a lot of guys. At least that was mm. the estimate one. Withdraw that evening and land the next day on what's called Little Macon Island. Um, now, this is all part of the Macon Island at, or Macon Atoll. Uh, the assigned objectives for the raid were as follows. And this directly from the orders for this operation destroy installations take prisoners gain intelligence and divert japanese attention that is it all there is to it sounds like it would theoretically be somewhat relatively easy uh the marines would reach the island by rubber boat after having been launched from two submarines assigned for this specific task and we'll get to those two boats here in just a second. Once Macon was chosen as the target, the two submarines were also chosen to transport the Marines, those being the USS Nautilus and the USS Argonaut. These are mine-laying submarines. Bill, these are huge submarines for their day, right? They are. They, they were <clears throat> very large submarines. And, and maybe we can go to the videotape. Somebody, by the way, corrected me and told me that's not a John Madden quote. I, I accept that. But here we go in Pearl Harbor. 
it's a long run on the surface to make an island right here. And um, these, but these boats are carry a lot of fuel. They're big, they're, in, they're designed to lay mines, as was said. So they had room to carry, I think it was something like um, 211 men total that were being distributed among these two submarines, 121, I think on Argonaut and the rest on Nautilus. And so that's the disposition. They were all heavily armed. And if I could zoom in on Macon, because remember I mentioned earlier that we thought Macon was more of a center of gravity, Little Macon Island specifically. I'm going to zoom in here. There's Little Macon Island there, or, or Macon Island, and there's Tarawa. Well, they're not far away from each other, but this Butari Tari Island is, you know, kind of the ar archipelago of Macon Island, where the initial landing is going to occur down here. Uh, where is it? There it is, Butari Tari, right there. And so the, this whole operation leading up to the, what we thought was the larger force on Little Macon Island was where the center, where they, we thought the center of gravity would be. Uh, turns out we very much um, misunderstood the disposition of forces here on Butari Tari and on Macon Island. Um, we, were, we believed it was a small force on Butari Tari that would be easily wiped out and that the larger force was on Macon Island. We were wrong, wrong about both. Is that right, Seth? Indeed. Yeah. And facing the Marines would be some 71 Japanese of the second 62nd Garrison Force. They had landed and established a base on Macon in early 1942 as part of the Marshall Islands Garrison Force. Um, and I said that correctly, Marshall Islands Garrison Force. I know this is not part of the Marshall Islands, but this unit was part of that force. Um, the Japanese on Macon were under the command of a warrant officer, Kanamitsu, of the Special Naval Landing Force, and were equipped with basic infantry weapons and absolutely no artillery support. They had no inclination that we were ever going to attack there. They had virtually no defenses. There were some, but nothing significant, as we will see. Um, the two companies... Be, go ahead. Right. So this should be easy. Yeah. There was a, you know, kind of a, a small force, of the, the, so small that it is commanded by a warrant officer. Right. Man, this should take us like 20 minutes. Uh, but, you know, I'll say it now. I said this in my book. What people that are experienced ground force fighters, um, I, I try to remind them every time I get them, I tried it past tense, to remind them every time I would get them on my submarine is that oftentimes, yeah, you got to worry about the enemy, but even when you're not confronting the enemy, the sea is trying to kill you. Before you ever face the enemy, the sea is trying to kill you. And I put that in my book because it's such a pivotal fundamental concept that I would say general infantry in both Marine Corps and Army folks fail to understand that's going to become a major factor here uh, mm -hmm. as this raid unfolds. Huge. And, and in fact, it's, it is the worst enemy that the Raiders face both times coming and going. Um, the two companies of Raiders boarded the subs on August 8th. So this is literally the day after D-Day on Guadalcanal and proceeded the submerged route to Macon. Once in the area on August 17th, so it takes them a while to get there, nine days, uh, plans almost immediately began to unravel. Uh, the plan of attack initially called for all landing boats to assemble alongside the Nautilus. So this is from both subs now, so that they might get underway together for simultaneous landing on two separate beaches. The continuous noise from the wash of the swell through Nautilus's, Nautilus's limber holes and the roar of the surf, because they were relatively close to the shore, made it almost impossible to hear any kind of verbal communication. Evans Carlson is literally screaming at the top of his lungs to these people as they're assembling, and nobody can hear him say hardly anything. Unless you're on top of the man, you can't hear what he's trying to say, which causes Mass confusion. Um, most of the outboard motors on the little rubber boats refused to start. 
Uh, and the swell of the sea made it difficult to keep the bubble like rubber boats alongside the submarine. Bill, this is what you were talking about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. As he's trying to get everything in gear and get everything straightened out, as I said, it was almost impossible to hear him because the submarine's running. It's, you know, doing its thing. Um, he decided that he was going to, instead of having his people land on two separate beaches, he says, to hell with it. We're all going to land on one beach which is significantly easier if he could get the word to everybody. And I can't fault the man here because he tried and literally you could not hear him. Um, yeah. I got the map Carlson, up here. So if you want to look yeah, at go it. Ahead. it the, boat, the submarines were here and the two beaches that he intended to land on, basically one company each were, were here and here. Now, again, the, um, <clears throat> when he realized that he the people his people as they were trying to get into the rubber rating craft could not hear him he called an audible and decided to have everybody land here the intent was an envelopment movement with the two companies right one here one here and they would both come down towards the japanese in the middle but when he called the audible and decided to land everybody on one beach one platoon didn't get the word. Again, couldn't communicate with his troops. And so they ended up going to the, the beach that they had originally intended to land on by themselves. So you got one yep. platoon isolated, the remainder of that same company and the other company both landing where, they, where Carlson had called the audible to tell them to go. And so that's exactly. how this is already starting to come unraveled. Yep. And that platoon that Bill was talking about was led by a lieutenant named Oscar Petros. Uh, Petros just, he just didn't get the word that they were landing at, two, at, at one beach as opposed to two. So when he does launch from the submarine and heads towards the beach, he goes towards his initial assigned beach. And his platoon is the only ones to land in that location. Now, the majority of Carlson's people, and I say majority because there were some people that had to be left behind on the submarine, eventually do make it back to or make it to shore, land at 0513. Uh, the landing itself had taken an eternity due to the high winds and the rough surf. And these guys, as you recall what I just said, a lot of the outboard motors that were part of these rubber craft couldn't start. They were swamp, literally swamped. So these guys are paddling through the surf with their rifle butts, with their hands, whatever they can, whatever they need to, to, to get ashore. Um, when they get ashore, these guys are smoked when they get to the shore because they, as physically prepared as they were, they weren't prepared to row into the damn island with their hands and their rifle butts. So when they get ashore, they are blasted before they ever even get moving. They have to collect themselves and kind of recharge and get going. So Petros's group lands at the uh, assigned beach. They actually landed there a little early. He made a perfect landing. Um, when he landed there, he found pretty quickly that he, so he turns around, looks around, says, where the hell is everybody? He figures out real fast that he's the only guy, or they're the only group there. Undeterred, he's like, I know what my mission is. I'm going to do it, boom. And he winds up landing actually in the Japanese rear. He does play an important part. You'll hear his name again here in a minute. So, Bill, once they get ashore, they collect themselves, they get their wind back, and then they move off. They they do move off on their mission, don't they? Yeah, they do. And, you know, again, the, the group is doing what they're supposed to do. Petros is heading to the northeast with Carlson's folks. And again, to, to you know, to reinforce what Seth said about how, how tired they were when they finally got to the beach. You've got to get over these rollers, these waves that are rolling over the breakers, basically, waves that are rolling over the reef. And in order to do that, you need a lot of purchase in your paddling if you're not, if your motor doesn't work. And, you know, they even try to tow some boats, I think, using boats with motors, towing boats without. It is very difficult to get through these breakers again, as I, as I learned with my Marines on my rubber, rubber or rating craft with the right equipment. And so these guys did not have the right equipment. So they're trying to, to do this envelopment with the Japanese that they believe are here. And in fact, the Japanese are pretty much where they think they're going to be. 
And, and so Carlson directs that the raid begin. He does. And he assumes that, that they have landed under the cover of, you know, the cloak of invisibility, shall we say. And to a point they have, however, once they get ashore, one of the Marine riflemen accidentally discharges his rifle. And, you know, you see it in movies. One guy shoots and everybody's alert. And whether that is the truth here or not, nobody really knows. Nobody will ever know. But in Carlson's mind, he heard that one Marine fire off his weapon accidentally. And he's like, our cover's blown. Let's just go in there and just haul ass and just whoop ass and do it now. And that is exactly what he does. And, and, and as opposed to doing a, a sort of, I don't want to say casual advance by any means, but taking his time, they just rush forward like a wave uh, a company led by Lieutenant Merwin Plumley sees the road on the lagoon side of the island and blew past Japanese defensive positions before the Japanese even had time to man them uh, by 0545. So this is roughly 30 minutes after they land. Plumley reported that his men had captured the government house without opposition. It's going well. And for the most part, most of this raid does go well. It's the aftermath that goes down the down the commode. And we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. With Company B, B behind Company A, uh, A Company ran into Japanese machine gun and sniper fire, halting their advance. So once they capture the government house, they run into Japanese resistance. The Japanese realize that, hey, somebody's here. They start mounting uh, defenses, and they basically shut the Marines down. If you look at the map Bill's got here, that's a narrow strip of sand here. I mean, this is there's not a whole hell of a lot of room for flanking movements. There's not a lot of room for envelopment maneuvers here. I mean, it, it's kind of – it's a one-way street here, isn't it, Bill? I mean, look at that thing. Yeah. One company did run to the government – the road here that's on the lagoon side. Of the island so they're, they're patrolling down that road the other companies patrolling down here they're trying to get a little bit of a pincer movement around the japanese that are entrenched here and it helps that the japanese you know were surprised but these guys aren't going to just throw their hands up and walk away they're taking cover in whatever buildings they can kind of you know what we call hooches these days right kind of Vietnam style, Afghanistan style, name your war. And um, they're shooting from not, not necessarily cover, but concealment. So you can't see where they are very well. And, and our, our guys are taking hits. We are. We are. We're starting to take some casualties. And more importantly, not the casualties are uh, something you don't, you, we don't take it uh, lightly, but more importantly is throwing off the timetable because they're being held up. They can't advance. They can't complete their, their objectives here. Uh, while pinned down, there is a gentleman named Sergeant Clyde Thomason. He's a native of Atlanta, Georgia. He decides, you know what, We're, we can't lay here all day and take fire. We're going to, we have to move and I'm going to start the movement. Uh, he gets up. Now, this is not a small dude. He is six foot, four inches tall. This is a big Boy, I mean, he stands out like a sore thumb. He stands up and just in the middle of this firefight decides to coolly walk up to this one hut where it's assumed that there's a Japanese sniper in there. Fire is coming from this general vicinity. Thomason is like, it can only be coming from one place. He walks up to this hut, kicks the door open and shoots the guy in the back of the head. The Japanese that was in the hut was facing the opposite, or, well, kind of at an angle away from the door, firing on Marines and inflicting casualties from his concealed position. Thomason just walks in there, kicks the door open, blam, blows the guy away. And then at that point, the advance starts to continue. Um, he, again, just a perfect example of coolness under fire. And, you know, you, you find that one person in the unit that decides this is what I'm going to do. I know it needs to be done and I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get this job done. Uh, Thomason, again, soonly that shortly thereafter, after they begin their advance, again, they're pinned down again by Japanese machine gun fire. He again gets up, exposes himself to enemy fire, urges his men forward and charges a Japanese machine gun position. Uh, the enemy opens fire and winds up, unfortunately, killing Thomason, who had rallied his men, who eventually do take over that Japanese machine gun position, kill everybody in it, and take two more following that because of the example of their of their leader there, Sergeant Thomason. 
Thomason is later awarded the Medal of Honor for these actions. This Medal of Honor action, not necessarily the awarding of the action, this Medal of Honor action is the first Medal of Honor action performed by an enlisted Marine in World War II that earns the Medal of Honor. Uh, John Bassalone is the first enlisted Marine to receive it, but Thomason is the first enlisted Marine to perform the actions for which he is awarded the Medal of Honor. Um, they're not making a whole lot of progress here, even though there's not a ton of Japanese on here. As we were saying, the, the island is so damn narrow that, you know, a small unit can hold up a larger unit with accurate rifle fire and heavy machine gun fire. And that is exactly what the Japanese are doing here. Uh, the Marines are stopped cold in their attacks. The Raiders, despite all their training and all their automatic weaponry and their, you know, their, their spirit are stopped cold in their tracks by the Japanese here. And casualties are slowly starting to mount on the Marine side. Um, the Japanese, whose casualties had steadily been increasing, decided that a bonsai attack was the best idea to float down the stream here. They decided that they're going to launch not one but two bonsai attacks to theoretically crush the Marines that are laying in front of them. And it's actually it's the best thing that the Japanese could have done for the Marines. Because as the Marines are laying there, pinned down under fire, these Japanese emerge from their emplacements, they emerge from their defensive positions and their concealment, and they rush straight at these Marines who are loaded down with automatic weapons and M1 Garands, and the Marines just cut them down. In two waves, they kill nearly everybody there. What the Raiders did not know is that at after that second bonsai attack, they had effectively killed about 95% of the Japanese on that island, but they didn't know yeah. this. Basically, these bonsai attacks were the Japanese presenting themselves to be killed. And so, you know, they were they were fairly effective at concealment. The Marines didn't know where they were. It was going to be a, uh, you know, it was going to be a really slugfest to root them out. <clears throat> but the Japanese just did the kind of like the worst thing possible from the Japanese point of view, best thing possible from the Marines point of view by charging them. And that was over here in this area uh, where they were just did the bonsai attack on the way up. And so that was that as far as the, what was left then was snipers. And now you've got this Lieutenant Petros who landed in the correct beach because he hadn't got the word about the, you know, the revision of the plan. He and his 12 men find himself uh, behind the Japanese line, such as it is, with no friendly support. So keeping his ultimate mission in mind, he decided that his platoon would cut across the island and head towards the wharf area. And again, the wharf area is right here, King's Wharf and Anchong Wharf. So they land over here and then the government wharf up here. I'm sorry. This is the one that he's yeah, headed no, towards. Yeah, yeah. So he's trying to go up northeast, as I said earlier. Um, and near the trading station, they found a group of Japanese huddling together um, and in the firefight that followed, he was able to kill all of them with a loss of three Marines in the process. He burned, his men burned a truck, set a radio station on fire, lit fire to several houses and huts, and headed back to the beach to prepare to make their way through the surf back to Nautilus, which is, I believe, at this point, mission accomplished. Since they're isolated, they figured they needed to call their own shots and get back on their own timeline. Yep. And he does. Petros performs his mission to a T because you got to remember what Bill had just said. He was out of communication. He he assumed that the rest of his raiders had landed, but he didn't know really where they were. Obviously, he could hear the gunfire and he knew what his mission was. He headed towards there. Never did he run into any of his raiders. Not one time did he run into any of the members, any other members of the second raider battalion while he was on that island. It's only when he gets back to the boat does he I'm like, hey, guys, where you been? Um, at 1130. So what is the Japanese response to this? At 1130, uh, Japanese, two Japanese reconnaissance aircraft flew over the island and dropped two bombs as the firefight continued. The planes did absolutely no damage to the Marines or their own people, for that matter. But it did force the two submarines to submerge. Now, you got to remember uh, Nautilus and Argonaut are sitting surfaced uh, outside the island waiting for these guys to come back. It does make them plunk down. Um, about an hour later now, 
these two Japanese recon aircraft report back that, hey, something's going on down here. There's two American submarines here. Very clearly, there's a firefight going on down here. You people need to send some support down here because something, you know, something ain't right. Uh, about an hour later, 12 enemy aircraft appeared in the sky with two flying boats making a landing or trying to make a landing in the lagoon. It was learned later that the two flying boats were indeed carrying Japanese reinforcements for this very action. Uh, as the two flying boats attempted to land, they came under immediate fire from Carlson's people uh, using their automatic weapons and two boys anti-tank rifles, which are really cool weapons that uh, you didn't see a lot of uh, implementation in the war, but they are utilized here to great effect. Uh, one of the Japanese aircraft burst into flames and the other crashed as it attempted a touch and go on the lagoon. So as this first one's coming in, it shot up by automatic weapons fire and the boys and a tank rifle. It catches fire, bam, crashes into the lagoon. The other plane sees this and says, nah, -uh, and they, they basically touch and go in the water. And when they do, they're lit up by the Marines and they too crash. All Japanese occupants are killed. Um, the remaining Japanese aircraft bombed and strafed the Marines, but no Marine casualties were sustained. So the Japanese are clearly aware that something is going on here. They do attempt to send reinforcements down there to help their fellow countrymen out, but it goes terribly awry when they come under heavy fire from the Marines. Um, it's around this time, and there are natives on this island, not many, but there are some. It's around this time that natives approached Carlson and informed him that two Japanese ships were in the lagoon. Now, Carlson can't see clear across the island despite its size. Uh, he's informed that there are two Japanese ships in the lagoon. At once, he radios the submarines to lay fire onto these uh, two Japanese vessels, which the submarines do and miraculously sink these two Japanese vessels with their deck guns. Mm -hmm. This is where the problem comes from, though. Not that the Japanese ships are there or that the Japanese ships are sunk by the submarine uh, deck guns. It's that in his mind now, Carlson believes that, oh my God, there's two Japanese ships here. More than likely, there are a ton of Japanese troops here. Again, he has no idea that he's killed about 95% of the people on that island. He immediately says, this ain't good. We're gone. And he pops smoke because he feels that and now his force is threatened that is going to be overwhelmed by a force that is going to be much larger and much stronger, even though he has no earthly clue that there are, there is no force here. And he pulls out probably quick. Well, not probably definitely quicker than he probably should have. Right, Bill. Yeah. I find it ironic that this element, right? Irregular warfare element, uh, second Raider battalion, which is supposed to, among other things, specialize in recon, hasn't reconned the Island. So, so they can be aware of, uh, what the troop concentration was before they, you know, engage. Now he right. accelerated his engagement because of the accidental discharge. I get it, but still, I mean, you send scouts out, you send observation posts, you send, you know, uh, individual Marines or Marine groups of Marines out to try to figure out where do this, you know, are there other pockets? Am I going to get, is there a pocket that's going to attack me from the rear? What's my rear guard look like? It's, it appears from when from you read this that he didn't do any of the kind of common sense, you know, blocking and tackling stuff you're supposed to do when you conduct a raid like this. Right. So, yep. you know, the, the the submarines have sunk the ships. He's thinking, OK, did these ships discharge people before they were sunk? Are there troops ahead of me that I don't know about? So you scout. You don't panic. And run. And by the way, when you pop smoke, that was figurative, not literally. Literal right. radio. Yeah. <laughs> that we're, we're gonna we're gonna come, um, we're gonna, you know, exfil. And so yep. you need to surface to pick us up. And and that was kind of the thing he did. So he calls his officers together, and again, gung ho, work together. Rather than say, This is what we're gonna do, he discusses what, what to do, what mm -hmm. should we do? And remember, another attack was planned. Right. For the next day, they weren't supposed to exfil yet. Jimmy Roosevelt and the battalion ops officer stated that a withdrawal right now would be the best option because they understood that they didn't understand the enemy disposition, which is a problem. Carlson was concerned that he may become too heavily engaged if he advances further, so and he wouldn't be able to exfil under fire. 
So he decides to withdraw. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, that that whole exfiltration under fire is huge because think about the time that he had getting to the island in the first place. So if it's that tough going in, it's probably going to be that tough or worse getting out. And that's that's laying on his mind. And he makes a decision that we're going to we're going to get out of here. Um, he leaves a covering force of about 20 Marines behind. Uh, as he breaks contact, uh, this covering force is obviously there, so the Japanese don't come rolling over him like a wave. Remember these guys. He starts with 211, right? Yeah. So you must be pulling out 180-ish. Now, that one platoon, I think by this point, they've already exfilled. Um, they have. And they're trying or at least they're on their way, yeah. yeah. Right about this time. And so let's say that platoon is, is 20, 30-ish Marines. So he's this group that he's pulling out. At this point, is 130, 140, ish. Yeah, yeah, and then and they've sustained casualties too. They've sustained, sustained several casualties. So the the raiders arrive on the beach around 1900 hours. Uh, their departure had been timed with the tide, so as to allow the rubber boats to handle the surf and get back to the subs. The surf, however, <laughs> refused to cooperate, as you know, Mother Nature is often want to do. Uh, the short, Just, quick rollers. Say again. The sea is trying to kill you. It, yes, indeed. And this is a perfect example of this. Uh, the quick rollers made it virtually impossible to launch the rubber boats that had been dragged from the foliage where they had been where they had lain hidden all day long. Um, the motors again refused to start. You know, the ones that didn't start before damn sure weren't going to start now. And the ones that had started before, for the most part, they're not starting either. Even the loss of equipment and jettisoning of motors didn't help any because the Raiders are throwing these boats into the water. They're trying to get the hell out of there. And Carlson tells them. Get rid of your rifles, get rid of the BARs, get rid of your ammunition, anything that you don't need to get back to that submarine, chuck it in the water and do it now. Yeah. Horrible decision here at this point. I understand yeah. he wants to get his men to the submarine, but you do not, especially if you're expecting a Japanese counterattack, you don't literally abandon your weapons and run, which is, is for all intents Again, and purposes, is what he's telling his people. The Marine ethos, you sleep with your weapon, right? You never give up your weapon. And here's a commander telling his Marines, leave your guns on the, on the beach, in the sand. And, and yeah. some of these boats tip over in the, in the surf. You got Marines going into the water that are trying to swim and tow their boats through the surf so they can climb back on the boat when they get past the breakers and then row the rest of the way or paddle with their hands the rest of the way back to the submarine. This is, again, pandemonium. This is really, is. really bad. This is a debacle, is, 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 a, is, a, is a simple way to put it. What raiders are able to make it back to the submarines do only under extreme physical exertion. 53 men in four boats return to Nautilus, while three boats each, I'm, I'm sorry, three boats reach Argonaut. Um a further 120 Raiders, Petros's people, are, by the way, are aboard the submarines by now. Uh, a further 120 Raiders even stay the night on the rain-swept beach of Macon Island. The submarines have get... to submerge at this point. They can't get out. Yeah. They can't get out. Right. As I said, keep this in mind, to make matters worse, Carlson had told his people, all of his Raiders, to get rid of your weapons. Throw your weapons away. By the way... Years ago, when they had done some, and, and we can talk about this briefly, the DPAA had gone back to make and to find some of the raiders that were buried there. Um, they actually found at least one M1 Garand that had been thrown in the surf and brought it back to the Marine Corps Museum. There's, there's a Facebook post from years ago about this very weapon, and it is a weapon that was used by second raiders on the raid that was thrown overboard as they were trying to get to surf. Really incredible artifact of history, but I digress. Mm -hmm. Um, only a museum geek like me would go, oh, that's cool. But it is. It's totally cool. <laughs> it really is. So at this point, he's got a buck 20 Raiders on there. He's got 120 Raiders. This includes the 20 Raiders that he left as a covering force. Those 20 Raiders are the only Marines with weapons on Macon Island. So he's got 100 guys sleeping on the beach, completely unprotected from a force that he believes is significantly larger than his force. This is a horrible decision. And at this point, like you said, Bill, you got a question like, what in the hell were you thinking here? 
You know, and that night the Japanese did send out a patrol that ran into the covering force. Those Japanese were killed, but this kind of reinforces Carlson's belief that there's more Japanese out there and that that, that this is going to go really bad in short order, that, that they're get overrun or something like that. And he doesn't understand that the Japanese, um, you know, have been decimated, you know, and that, but he see, all he sees is the Japanese are still full of fight and that he's weaponless. So he begins to panic. He calls another council of war, gung-ho, let's work together. What do we think we should do? And without input from anyone else this time, <laughs> this is the yeah. one time he, he fails to ask folks, what should we do? He says, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to surrender. Yeah. Surrender to who? The sand crabs, the land crabs? According to Carlson, his concern was for the wounded and for the president's son. Now, this is actually believable, but really? You're going to have the president's son surrender? What do you think they're going to do with him, Colonel Carlson? Yeah. You know, that you're giving them a great bargaining chip. So yeah. at 0330, Carlson sends a message, a messenger to find the Japanese CEO who doesn't exist. He's dead. And, offer us the, and he authorizes men to fend for themselves. And those who wanted could try to could try to swim for the submarines again. In other words, every man for himself. You got to be kidding me. No. That My goodness, Seth. <laughs> I, I want to go back to your initial point that you just made about Jimmy Roosevelt, because this is something that, again, and I'm not I don't want people to say, yeah, Carlson was a hero. Carlson's bravery under fire is never questioned, you know, never in question. His 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 performance under fire here was exemplary. He does a very good job on Guadalcanal under fire. He makes some stupid decisions there, too. But regardless of this, he, when the shooting starts, the man has his wits about him. He later goes on. He sees action at Tarawa. I mean, he the guy had you know plenty of guts. However, his decision making here is irrational. He had seen the Japanese fight in China. This is how he developed some of his tactics based off of the Chinese tactics against these very same type of people. He knew damn good and well, or he had to have known what the Japanese did with prisoners of war. And to your point, what do you think the Japanese, first of all, there was nobody there to capture them hardly, but what do you think the Japanese would have done with Jimmy Roosevelt? They probably would have pub publicly executed him right mm -hmm. there in Tokyo. I mean, it, it, it's asinine. I understand his concern for his friend, his executive mm -hmm. officer, but you got to think about the reality of the situation. And it's very clear at this point, Carlson did not have his head wrapped in that reality. He had no... I don't know. He was living in a fantasy world at this point, because if the Japanese had caught them, they'd have killed him like outright. And you'll see what happens later. And as it turns out, so, his failure to communicate effectively with his own troops is what saves him from himself, because yep. he didn't tell his people that he's sending a messenger just to offer terms of surrender to the Japanese. And so one of his covering force guys, the only Marines ashore with weapons, kills the messenger. <laughs> Japanese literally. Japanese messenger, by the way. Japanese, Japanese messenger. messenger. Literally, uh, the expression, don't shoot the messenger. Well, it was literally true here today. They shot the messenger who had the surrender note. So it never made it to the few Japanese that were left on the island. No, but the Japanese eventually do find it and they use it for propaganda later on. Tokyo Rose makes a uh, mm -hmm. specific broadcast regarding that later on in the war. But or later on in the war, later several weeks later. Um, to your point, Bill, where we were talking about every man for himself, one of the guys that says, you know what the hell with this, I'm getting out of here, is Jimmy Roosevelt. Uh, Jimmy Roosevelt, is he's he's not stupid. He realizes that, A, if the Japanese get me, I am a dead man. And, B, I'm not going to stick around here. You know, For all his faith in Carlson, I have to believe at this point, he's like, you know what, you're not, you're not performing to the – level that i thought you would and if it's every man for himself i'm getting the hell out of here and he does that very thing um later that night and early the following morning several boatloads of marines including roosevelt make it to the submarines uh, as dawn breaks the marines at the front line reported that there appeared to be no organized japanese resistance on the island 
with 70 oh. Raiders remaining. Yeah, really. With 70 Raiders remaining, those who could arm themselves with weapons laying around the battlefield and went in search of food. So this situation is rapidly deteriorating. Uh, Car Carlson himself carried out at least two patrols that demolished more Japanese buildings and scoured for food. Basically something that he should have done the day before. Instead of panicking and pulling back, he should have at least sent feelers out there, probes out there, recon out there to find out what the heck they're facing, which turned out to be virtually nothing. Realizing that the island was essentially clear, you got to you got to think at this point he had some serious egg on his face. Now, truth be known, the Marines did not his Raiders did not know that he had sent you know, offer for surrender. They things may have gone south for Carlson at this point. I'm not saying they'd have fragged him, but it may not have ended up very well. Regardless of this, uh, realizing that the island is essentially clear, the Raiders instructed the submarines to meet them at the lagoon side where the surf was weaker. Uh, the Raiders carried the rubber boats clear across the other side of the island and borrowed a native outrigger. Uh, by 2300, the remaining Raiders were aboard the submarines, or so they thought. Again, piss poor communication on Evans Carlson's part because... Because of the chaos, getting aboard the submarines, the two companies were intermingled, which is understandable, and an accurate headcount could not be acquired until the submarines made it back to Pearl Harbor. It was here that casualties were calculated. 18 killed in action, 12 missing in action, 12 missing in action. Nine Marines who were perfectly well were left on Macon Island because of the complete lack of control that Evans Carlson had in this situation. And these aren't Petros's people that were off by themselves. These were Marines that were within the group that Carlson was in mm -hmm. and they got left behind. Yeah. And of course it was only a matter of time before they be, were, became captured. There were some Japanese on little Macon Island, a few, mm -hmm. but the, you know, after the Americans exfilled, the island was reinforced, and of course, there was nobody there to shoot down the airplanes that were coming in to reinforce the island. And what did they find? They found these nine Americans on the island. The nine left behind were captured, and they were tortured for weeks. Four weeks after their capture, they were sent to nearby Kwajalein, where they were tortured again and eventually beheaded. Mm -hmm. So what do you think would have happened to Roosevelt's son? I mean, come on, you know. What? Yep, so, you know, just one of those things where you, you wish it wasn't this way. You wish we hadn't learned this lesson. You wish that Nimitz hadn't authorized it. You, you wish that King had been a little more assertive. It, but it was, of course, the president of the United States. He would have need, needed to buck in order to mm -hmm. keep this operation from happening. You wish Carlson had better tactical sense. Um, he might have had pretty good operational sense from the standpoint of developing irregular warfare tactics, but in execution, the tactical sense of understanding enemy disposition, things like that, he failed in a lot of basic blocking and tackling. And the result of all of this was, you remember the intention of the raid was to gather intel, which it did not. Right. It was to take prisoners, which it did not. It was to divert Japanese forces away from Guadalcanal, which it did not. It was to, you know, convince the Japanese that a larger raid was in progress to cause, you know, them to withhold strategic reserves for this potential attack on the Gilbert Islands, which it did not. The only thing it did was to cause destruction loss of American lives, and the beheading of these nine poor American prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it you could classify this as a complete, oh, and by the way, there were 46 Japanese killed, 27 were still left alive when, when the Raiders pulled out. You could classify this, though, in my opinion, as an utter failure. And I mean, we I mentioned this, I kind of poked at this in episodes previous where I mentioned Carlson almost got his entire command killed and captured. It, it, yeah, it, it, he kind of did. Um, not surprisingly, the American press hailed it as a tremendous success, uh, you know, as daring, you know, raid behind was, enemy lines. And it was. It was it a was daring different. raid behind enemy lines. Yeah. It wasn't a huge success. Uh, 
An American submarine flotilla returns from one of the most daring raids of the war, a land invasion of a Japanese-held island by United States Marines. Admiral Nimitz, Pacific Fleet Commander, comes to personally congratulate the officers. Lieutenant Colonel Evans Carlson, famed throughout the South Pacific as leader of Carlson's Raiders, and Lieutenant Colonel James Roosevelt, eldest son of the President, his second in command. Booty captured during the 40-hour attack, which wiped out the entire Japanese garrison, including planes and gunboats. A two-handed Jap sword is brought back as a souvenir for the Admiral. U.S. casualties were few, and they all came back. Poorly executed. Yeah, the, the press and the Navy believe that the raid did divert forces from Guadalcanal and fooled the Japanese into thinking that the raid was a major landing. Admiral Ugaki's diary, which is very hard to find, but if you can find it, I highly recommend you picking it up. Uh, it's called Fading Victory. Very fascinating. Admiral Ugaki's war diary states that the Japanese knew that the raid came from submarines and was just that. It was a raid made by American Marines. Uh, no forces were diverted from Guadalcanal. His diary also states that the Japanese high command was not worried about making in any way, shape, or form. They did not care about making. And to that end, this raid is a failure. It, it is a complete failure. What the raid may have accomplished, Bill, and you you alluded to this just a minute ago, which was, of course, not intended that we're going to see in later episodes this season, was that it did compel the Japanese not to divert forces from Guadalcanal because they had enough forces to spread their forces wherever, frankly, they wanted to. They added forces to a little island called what? Tarawa. Yes. Yeah. Which is and, where their real gravity was, right? And they were afraid that somebody tried something like that there. So they strengthened Tarawa. So the law of unintended consequences yep. um, is in effect here. Yep, yep. Now, Carlson later receives a Navy cross for the raid, albeit under a cloud. Uh, his performance under fire, as I said, was without question. The guy had guts to spare, frankly. Uh, when the shooting is, when they're, when they're shooting to be done, he didn't hesitate. However, uh, it was after the shooting was finished that we discussed here, you know, where some of his, not some of all of his decisions were called into question. Um, several JOs after the raid uh, questioned his decision making, especially after they found out that he offered surrender to an enemy that was virtually non-existent. They didn't know that Carlson had offered surrender until well after they got back to Pearl Harbor. And they're like, you did what? There's a photograph of Carlson after he gets back on the Nautilus. I think it was the Nautilus, one of the, the submarines that he one of the um, built to. Yeah. And you could see in this photograph how dejected, I'm sure you'll show it, Seth, sure. how dejected yep. he is. He looks hang dog because mm -hmm. I think he knows even then, you know, before any of the post mission analysis, after action report, any of that occurred, he knows how bad he screwed up. And oh, yeah. you can see it in his face. It's not just fatigue you see in his face, which he would have had. But uh, you yeah. can tell this, you know, there, there was, you know, abject failure in his eyes. And, and that was so before his junior officers began questioning him or questioning his decisions, he you could see from this photograph that he's already questioning himself. Mm -hmm. Yep. A lot of his JOs believe that he had lost that aggressive spirit that had made him so charismatic. Uh, mm -hmm. And he lost his aggressive spirit and his decision making when it needed to be at its highest point. And they realized that. Um, and if you look at what happens after this, yes, he's still in command of Second Raider Battalion when they go to Guadalcanal. He still is in command through their ordeal, which is the long patrol, this the 30 day, 30 odd day patrol, where when they come back, they're completely spent because again, he's attempting to use Chinese tactics on Americans in the Guadalcanal, which is it's just asinine. You know, when the Not island, China. as you said, the, the sea is trying to kill you, the island on Guadalcanal mm -hmm. is trying to kill you. So he he's in command of second raiders until then. And after that, he ain't. Now, yes, the Raiders are disbanded at one point, but uh, and they're folded into the regular Marine divisions later. But Carlson is not given any significant command 
after this. I, I think it is realized that, yeah, he kind of screwed the pooch here and we're not going to give this. He's, he's not like Red Mike Edson, who becomes, you know, a, a high figure in the war after Guadalcanal. Carlson, he sees action, but as an observer, as an, a liaison officer, he is no longer in command of any kind of large infantry force at all after Guadalcanal. So he gets two choice, two chances to prove himself and prove his tactics. And tactics. for all intents and purposes, they don't, and the long patrol can be said to be a success because they kill over 500 Japanese. But, you know, yeah. when they come back there, the Raiders are smoked. And I mean, here he almost gets his entire command captured or killed. So, yeah. and when they, when, when he loses command, when they relieve him again, he would, it was not a DFC, you know, relief for cause or anything like that. Um, it, they reform his battalion kind of in the, in the conventional frame right. again. So it reverts to a, the you know, looking to look like first rate of battalion. So the, the, the notion of we're going to build a special battalion, specially configured for regular warfare that kind of evaporates and they become a shock troop force, just like the first Raider battalion. Yep. And then, and then when the Raiders are disbanded as a whole during World War II, these guys that are still there, they're, they're put into the Marine infantry division, the regular Marine divisions that are there. A lot of these guys, a lot of Carlson's Raiders, specifically from the Macon Raid and or the Long Patrol, uh, they wind up on Iwo Jima. You know, there, there, there are guys literally who fought some of the ground campaign in the earliest part of the war that are landing on those black sands in February 19th, 1945. I knew a couple of them. So these are guys that, you know, literally saw the entire war. Uh, so Carlson's raiders die on the vine, but his raiders themselves see quite a bit of war after this. Um, Bill, do you have anything you want to throw in here that, that we haven't already uh, only covered? What note, the raiders come back as a unit in the 20-year sure. war against the global war on terror as the Marines' contribution to American Joint Special Operations Forces and they're performing magnificently again today. Absolutely. And they performed magnificently during World War II. This raid, when mm -hmm. they, as, as we hopefully demonstrated, when they did meet the enemy, they succeeded. It was just some command decisions that caused this raid, in, in our opinion, to go from being a somewhat you know, success to a, frankly, dismal failure. Um, so... Anyway, um, before we close, I just want to add in a personal note. Uh, as we record this episode, it is May 10th, which is my son's birthday. Uh, we did not do this purposely. We recorded one on my daughter's birthday, and this is my son's birthday. Um, so I just wanted to say, take time out of this recording to wish my boy a happy birthday. You're the one who made me a dad, and I cannot be more proud of the young man you are becoming. Happy birthday, buddy. I love you in all happy my heart. birthday. On your way to Eagle Scout, as I recall. And, he uh, is getting yeah. close. He's a star. Yeah, and he's going to be life probably by the end of the summer. So. I'm a lifetime member of the National Eagle Scout Association, and I'm very proud of him and hope he continues the heritage. Well, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll, I will pass on your sentiments. And I got a strong feeling that we're going to be welcoming an Eagle Scout in the household here within the next year or two. So Look forward he's, to the he's making the journey. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. So with that, we want to thank you for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Wherever you receive your podcast, give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. Also, if you want to see the video version of this and any of our other episodes, tune into our YouTube channel. Um, please like and subscribe to the videos there once again. If you have a question, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. So once again, my name is Seth Perrin. I want to thank you very much for listening. Bill? And I'm Bill Toady. See you again next week.